Welcome to the Find Your Voice, Change Your Life podcast with psychologist Dr. Doreen Downing. Listen in as Doreen interviews people who felt they didn't have a voice or who suffered extreme speaking anxiety. You'll hear stories about how they struggled to speak up, what they did to find their authentic voice, and the confidence they now feel to speak up and make an impact. If you want to get started right away to find your voice, download Doreen's free 7-Step Guide to Fearless Speaking at Doreen7Steps.com. And now, here is Doreen. Hi, this is Dr. Doreen Downing, and I'm a psychologist, and I get curious about how people get to be how who they are and what life experience has led to their magnificence. And that's what I feel like I am going to get to do today because I feel like my guest I'm having here today is magnificent. He comes with a lot of life experience and challenges, lots of struggle, but that's what's so magnificent is when you do make it through all those, you have a story to tell and you have so much to offer the world. So this is Sean Langwell. Hello, Sean. Hi, Doreen. Thank you for having me today. I'm super excited about this. Yes, I I am too. You know, I want to read the bio that you sent me so that people get a sense right away you know, what you are about. So, yeah. Okay. John Langwell is the immediate past president of the California Writers Club, Redwood Writers, and past president of Toastmasters of Petaluma, an international speaker and top producing media salesperson. He is the author of the memoir, Beyond Recovery, A Journey of Grace, Love, and Forgiveness, and the recent release, 10 Seconds of Boldness, The Essential Guide to Solving Problems and Building Self-Confidence. His personal mission is to add value to people and businesses everywhere, more specifically to encourage, inspire, and help people become brave and confident enough to believe they can accomplish their dreams and goals. And you get to find Sean at www.seanlangwell.com. And of course, that will be in the show notes. So for sure, find this wonderful human being that I get to spend a little bit of time with today. Hi. Hi, Sean. Hi, Doreen. Yeah. Well, I always like to start with a little bit of grounding. So people get a sense of the journey, you know, it started somewhere way back when, Um, obviously, early life is when we first come to know who we are, because the world surrounds us with some kind of welcoming or um, some kind of dysfunction that we have to participate in. So if you could kind of journey back first and let us know some of those early life experiences. God, it's it's hard to escape this one. And I'm not going to go back to Mr. Peabody's way, 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 way back machine. <clears throat> but I will suffice it to say that um, I'm a child of the 60s. I was born and raised in, in Daly City and moved over to Marin County when I was, what, five years old and grew up there for, um, I don't know, up until I was in graduated high school. But the pivotal moment, defining moment really in my life. You know, my dad was a fireman, firefighter. I looked to him as a hero. I just, I loved him. He, you know, he, mm-hmm. he loved me and I got to hang out with him. Mm-hmm. And one day out of the blue, unexpectedly, he took off and left me, my mom and two younger brothers without saying goodbye. <gasps> and I was 12 years old at the time. Um, I was valedictorian of eighth grade. I was just you know, I, I was a good student and I, I sought that praise and accolade, but I was also very much of an introvert, very shy, withdrawn, got my validation out of doing good in school, whether it was from parents, teachers, friends, I was considered the brainiac. And um, those will, we'll, we'll have further conversation about what that happened, but the, the quick and dirty about it was, um, I was impressionable. I was a young, you know, teenager, soon to be teenager. And I sought escape through drugs and alcohol. And I basically ran with that from the time I was 12 until I was 
22 when I got sober, and that was on October 10th of 1986, coming up on 36 years of continuous sobriety. So that's it in a nutshell. Um, there's a lot of life experience in that narrative arc, if you will, but we'll get into it a little bit later and show how um, it's shaped who I am today. Mm -hmm. The narrative arc, I like that. And because for those who aren't watching you, there's an arc right behind you on your screen, and it's a rainbow. <laughs> so I think that's something that we're bringing into our conversation today is the oh, the sense of uh, beauty and magic and power that is what we live in and what we live with. So I wanted to just get back to what you said about those early, early um, moments and school being in the place where you found your, you know, your power, basically. And I would say that was true for me, too, that I, uh, I, I loved the grades, I loved uh, the structure, uh, and home was not the place where I got the kind of uh, positive attention. And mm -hmm. so, yeah, I went all the way to PhD to keep on getting those goodies from teachers. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but I do want to, when you said that abandonment moment, you might say, you know, my abandonment moment was like when I was five years old, my father left, but here you already had so much more of a relationship. And then the way that you talked about your connection your love your admiration of him and then boom gone yeah and you know there's a story I, I i share it frequently and i'll turn it into a bigger story but you know just for a visual even though most of this is probably going to be audio you know parents my parents both loved me and i don't want to overshadow that yes my dad made a decision to leave us for another woman and have another kid um but those formative years he'd do things with me that were just like super tender loving things and he you know as a fireman he has a heart of gold he had a heart of gold uh -huh. but after a bath you know one of the things i loved about him was after a bath he always used to take a towel and just dry my hair vigorously and it may sound super small but a lot of kids and, and parents don't necessarily, they don't share affection in, in today's day and age is, and that's often indicative of a lot of problems. So for me, that was one of those things that I just loved every single night. Some kids hate taking a bath, but I loved it because I got that rough and heavy duty towel dry in my hair every single day. And it just meant that my dad loved me. Oh, I know exactly what you mean. My memories of my father standing in uh, my sister in my bedroom doorway and singing uh, Oh Danny Boy or other kind of uh, Irish songs. And that that memory, that positive memory that having been loved early on, I think is, you know, this podcast is about, <clears throat> this podcast is about voice, finding our voice. And did we have a voice? And um, partly was our voice being received and were we loved? And I think that if you're not loved, your voice doesn't feel like it's very safe out there in the world. No, and that, you know, th that's the core element of the book. You know, the book at surface value, 10 Seconds of Boldness, The Essential Guide to Solving Problems and Building Self-Confidence. At the core, from my research and my own personal experience, the core of our humanity, our identity, our self-esteem it's, it's so simple, but it's so easy to overlook. And that's why I started with that is that one word love. It's mm -hmm. the core, core thread line through everybody's life. And along the way, unfortunately, that thread becomes threadbare and oh, frayed right. and right. other things happen in our lives that, you know, undermine the strength of whatever that bond is. Yeah. And, um, it's not uh, doom and gloom. There's ways to recover. There's ways to bounce out of a downward spiral and, and not blame everybody else for our situation. So I'm kind of going off on a little tangent. We'll get back to that in a sec. But um, love is the answer. There's mm -hmm. been way many movies written and lots of songs written about the word love. And there's a reason for it. 
Well, again, coming back to voice, it feels like if you're loved, and I, I like that uh, whole image of a thread that you're talking about, a thread through our lives, and those who don't have any kind of connection, uh, not having had love, I f- that to me feels like it's they don't know how to speak in a way uh, out because it's no longer, it's not, they aren't being loved. So why should they speak up? Mm-hmm. And you know what, Doreen, that's also, you know, there's different, I was encouraged to speak out. My mom, after my dad left, my mom really was outspoken and encouraged us to do and be whoever it was that we want and to not be shy about our voice. But even being an introvert, um, I, I was confident in the classroom because I knew the stuff almost to a fault. I was that smart ass little kid that sat in the front and raised his hand every time the teacher asked, what's the answer? I was that kid that you want to throw paper at it, you know, if you're sitting in the front row, but not everybody has that. And, you know, my wife is an example where they were, it wasn't that they were to be seen and not heard, but just a different family structure where, you don't want to bring the center of attention to you and you don't want to be outspoken. And it's not necessarily because you're not loved. It's because there's a different dynamic that's, I don't know how to totally describe it, but there's just different cultural influences to how people A, feel about themselves and B, how they communicate and interact with others in the world. And that ties into the core of what your show is, finding your voice and changing your life. Mm-hmm. Well, in a sense, I get that with the kind of attention and love and encouragement you got early on, there was a an inner confidence that you had. And then moving into drugs and alcohol, uh, it seemed like there was kind of getting lost or something. How, how would you? You know, the easiest way to describe this is I was trying to be everything that my father wasn't. And I don't know where that came from, but being the oldest of three boys, I took it upon myself to be A, the surrogate father figure for my brothers, and B, almost not in an incestuous way, but the surrogate husband for my mom. And why she had to go to work, I had to do all the stuff and I took it upon myself to do all the stuff around the house. So Um, that responsibility and being able, maybe that's part of the care and the nurturing, but it was another way of feeling validated by, um, doing and helping the family, if you will, and feeling like I had some purpose in this family, but the gap when my dad left, that was great, but I was internally in my mind. I was spun out of control and I felt seriously pissed off for a number of years. And I chose to use drugs and alcohol to mask those feelings. And, you know, the other big component of that was as I'm entering my teen years, you know, I started becoming interested in girls and I was so shy and fearful of even talking to them that Mm -hmm. alcohol in particular, liquid courage in the form of a 12 ounce bottle or a red sippy cup was my out to get me out of my head to have that liquid courage, confidence, bravado, whatever it was to feel socially um, adept enough to have a conversation with a woman. Mm, That's, that's pretty important there for listeners is to get the sense that voice was possible because you, you had alcohol. Isn't that, isn't that kind of ironic? is that your voice could be out there and you could approach girls uh, because you had alcohol. It's, that's, that loosens you up, I guess. Oh, it does until you go over the top and then you become a blabbering idiot. And that's <laughs> yeah. basically what happened to me. So uh-huh. when I stopped, that became another defining moment of how am I going to be mm-hmm. sociable? Am I going to be liked? Um, how am I going to have conversations? That was my crutch. It was a solution. And without it, now I took back this little thing of who am I and how do I go out in the world to, um, with some kind of, you know, some semblance of confidence. And I became a waiter. I became a salesperson. I became a father. I became a husband. And every single one of those opportunities or life experiences moved me further down the field to get a little bit more confidence and and to 
find my voice and to realize that I had something worthwhile, not only to say, but that could be helpful to other people. Yeah, well, I, I certainly know I've read the book and I feel that your life experiences you is your voice coming out and saying there's something else that's possible. But before I move into that, I just wanted to go back because I had this thought about, <clears throat> about addiction and alcoholism and the way that you talked about the, those years, um, teenage years mostly, that that's a voice also you know, whatever, where that was coming from, you said was anger. So it was like there was a, even though you weren't speaking it, you were expressing it. And people who have, I guess, addictions would be, we might be saying is they do have a voice. This is their voice. They're, (laughs) they're expressing it by their action. Yeah. And I think we all express our voice with our action or inaction. Uh, and, and I say that because there's a lot of people that are so consumed with their own lack of self-esteem or self-worth that they don't take that courageous 10 seconds of boldness first step forward and they stay in this safety. I mean, this is a lot of this stuff that we're talking about is not necessarily new. You can go all the way back to all the psychologists from the turn of the century and even earlier, but it's it's what we do with the information that we have and how we internalize process it, have this self-assessment to move forward with some degree of, of courageous and or blind faith that we're not going to die. If we do something that's out of our comfort zone, the comfort zone has been you know identified for a long, long time. The fact that we know a comfort zone exists doesn't necessarily make it easier to get out of it. Mm -hmm. It means that we need to be aware of it and also do things that are scary, not just the feelings and the thoughts, but the actions that go with it to take the steps forward to live on the edge, you know? Or yeah, definitely on the edge, if not uh, a little bit over at least. There was something that you said, or at least I either read about it or you told me about it, but you talked about voices in your head. Like you said, well, you know, I, I, you felt like you had a voice, but there were too many voices in your head. Yeah, I, I pulled this out because I'm like, did I write that? No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> you know, for the, the, for the listening audience or viewing audience, there's Doreen's got some great questions to ask so that we can have a meaningful conversation on air. And I don't remember what the specific question was, but it had to do with voices. And I'm going to read it verbatim, just a couple sentences here. It says, it's not that I don't have a voice. Mm -hmm. My problem is that I have too many. Mm -hmm. Most of them are in my own head. They are critics that love to lie to me. And I believe them. They say things like, you're not good enough. How can you help other people achieve their goals when you are struggling struggling to achieve your own? What if people don't get me? We all have these inner critics that try to undermine our success. They are like anchors keeping us stuck in fear, fear of failure, rejection, abandonment. Often they pick fights when I am progressing, creating seeds of self-doubt or a general feeling of imposter syndrome. Fortunately, I am aware of their existence and power, and I've developed tools and learned skills on how to conquer them. Mm-hmm. Well, that point of view, I think, is something that I, in all the 60 episodes that I've done here so far on Find Your Voice, Change Your Life podcast, I've not really heard that uh, point of view that yeah, we have voices, but what are those voices and where are they actually? Are they in our head? Are they really, uh, who, are they ours? Did Where did they originate? And are we listening to them? And how do we actually uh, recognize them and find out what our truth is and how to move forward and make choices? Yeah, and the, the clarity on this, um, if you're, if you show up, 
for the conference that we have, this is going to air long after the conference, but Doreen is going to be our featured keynote speaker at the Redwood Writers Conference on October 8th. And one of the other presenters there is Stephen Campbell, who is going to be specifically talking about how to overcome writer's block. The reason I'm bringing it up is he was kind enough to actually provide a page and a half or so in, in paragraph form a serious contribution from a neuroscientistic perspective for my book. And in, in summary, one of the things that Stephen has discovered through his own research in, in corporate work with a lot of Fortune 500 companies is the mind does not know the difference between fact or fiction. So to your point, Doreen, you know, the mind will believe what we choose to believe. And that isn't just a, a Pollyanna statement. It's the absolute truth. And to the degree and extent that we believe the lies in our own head, wherever they come from, they come from a lot of different sources, but it's all a, a combination of upbringing, of socialization, of what we watch, read, listen to, yes. and more importantly, uh -huh. the self-talk that we have. And there's been a lot of talk about, you know, mindfulness and self-talk and what we say to ourselves when we're talking to ourselves. And, mm -hmm. you know, this whole concept of voice. Um, I'm going to share a, a real brief story. Um, we have time. So early in recovery, I was super, super angry. And I don't know exactly what it was, but I was just feeling like lost. And like, I could not, I could not figure this stuff out. And I wanted it. I wanted the obsession to be gone. And I laid in a bed and heard these voices in my head that just said, you know what, you're not worth it. And I'm editing myself. It wasn't quite so kind. They were yelling expletives at me. And this is all in my own mind, but it was also a reflection of how I felt inside. Mm -hmm. And I got to the point where I literally got so angry. I blurted out loud and screamed, get the blank out of my head. Mm -hmm. I don't want to do this anymore. And I'm sharing that because if anybody's ever gotten to that place, sometimes we need to do that where it was like, mm -hmm. I don't want to hear this anymore and call me a crazy person. Cause I was at the time, but from that moment forward, I addressed it. I had the courage to face it and my entire world changed. And I went down a different path to look more towards the solution of what I wasn't doing. And Ultimately, what I found out through five years of therapy is that I had certain things that I was continuing to do that needed to change if I was to seriously change. Ooh. Uh, the what you just described about get out of my head <laughs> is something in psychology we call thought stopping. You know, it's it's like you say stop to yourself, just like you might say stop to a child who's about to run out into the road, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you just go stop. And you, yeah, that kind of energy creates a, a break in the pattern, interrupts the pattern. Yeah. And that's what it sounds like. Wow, that, that moment feels like so uh, powerful to have it be. I mean, I know there's lots of moments that lead up to the, the powerful change moment, but still it's, it's good to feel the, the shift that happened for you. Well, yeah. And there's another a simple metaphor. My stepson's downstairs doing laundry right now. And it just reminded me of that. Um, if you've ever done a load of laundry and you happen to throw a bunch of towels or something like a bath rug in there and you go do something else and you hear that, thump, 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 that's out of balance. That washer won't spin properly. And it'll probably end up denting the side of your laundry room if you're not too careful or whatever. So like you just mentioned, Ori, the way to resolve that is to stop, open up the lid, rebalance the load, close the lid, hit the button again, and walk away. And don't sit there and watch it. Listen for a second, but assume that what you just did is going to be okay and good enough so you can go do something else. Oh, I love what, the way you're saying it, too. It's almost like, hey, folks, here's the here's the key. Here's the secret. Let me tell you. So that to me feels like you and your message and your voice in the book is coming out right there about mm -hmm. how to. Well, I know it's more about that, you know, the 10 seconds of boldness, but the actual what we do 
around yeah. our thoughts and how we balance and then move on. Well, a, a thought without action is just a thought and the thought is not going to kill you. It's not going to do anything, but to the degree that we act or don't act or react to the thoughts that we have about ourselves and our internal or external locus of control, which I'm sure you're familiar with. I don't have time to explain what all that is, but um, if we don't do something different, it's Newton's second law of, 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 of physics. Every action has an equal opposite reaction. Now, I'm, I'm totally botching this, but basically what I'm trying to say is a body in motion will continue to stay in motion until acted on by an outside force. And that outside force is lifting the lid, rebalancing the load and closing the lid. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's so, it's funny because I'm, I'm grinning because we all do this. We all beat ourselves up. We all say, oh, I wish I could have, should have, would have done that differently. And oh man, I made a mistake. And ah, guess what? We're not perfect. And I talk a whole lot about that in this book because we all do it. I still do it. Um, the, the irony of this whole process is Almost every little bit of advice that I put in this book from personal experience or the the other contributors to the process, I have to live every single day. And it's not a set it and forget it, one and done type of thing. I have to constantly practice what I'm preaching in this book and to not do it. My own internal dialogue says, well, how can I seriously encourage somebody else to do this if I'm not following my own advice. And to me, that's not what I'm all about. There's a certain element of integrity and I need to be doing these things. Am I perfect at it? Absolutely not. None of us are. Uh Yeah. Well, I like uh, your ability to write about it in the book. It just feels like you unzip and let us in on all the mistakes (laughs) and that, that there's an acceptance of that. Can you, can you talk about the 10 second idea. Yeah. I mean, do you want to know where, where it came from? And sure. Share that. So long story long, maybe short, I'll try and make it as brief as possible. I started this book shortly after I wrote my first, first one, the memoir um, beyond recovery. And it just a whim. I wanted to I was originally trying to brand this as something that could be beyond goal setting and and this whole big idea that just didn't go anywhere. It was not the book that was supposed to be written. I wrote over two to three years, I wrote about 100,000 words. And right before the pandemic, um, I was doing really, really well in my day job as a media sales, uh, you know, award-winning media sales person for the Bay Area News Group. And all of a sudden, my sales went through the floor and I'm sitting here writing about encouraging stuff, goal setting, how to deal with your own inner critics, blah, blah, blah. And I couldn't write it. I'm like, how can I realistically feel confident about this information that I'm trying to share with the world? And I can't even apply it to my own life. And I felt seriously dejected. Um, I was, I'm much more hard. I'm harder on myself probably than anybody else ever will be, but I felt like an utter failure and I sat with it. And then one day I'm like, it was feast or famine. I had to actually do something to change this, or it was going to impede my ability to make a living and put food on the table and pay the mortgage. And I literally grabbed a three by three post-it note and a Sharpie and wrote four words on it. 10 seconds of boldness. And I stuck it on the wall above my phone at work. Uh I stared at it for about two to three weeks before Uh I actually had the courage to do what I had written, that my intent was to actually be able to make cold calls for new business. Because part of the reason I wasn't hitting my goal was my own inactivity of becoming complacent because I had coasted and done so well for so long that I didn't have a current pipeline full of new potential business opportunities that I was nurturing that could potentially close so that I wouldn't have a gap and not make my sales goal. So the solution to that was my own doing. It was, I needed to call more people and reach out and try and offer value to them for helping them build their business. And I figured it out. Three weeks later, I started doing it and 
all through the entire pandemic for the last two years, I've been very fortunate to have my sales increase over 22% year over year for the last two years, which is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. A lot of businesses Mm -hmm. lost 30 to 40 or 50% of their business. And somehow that simple phrase became the title of this book. It became a moniker. It became almost a mantra and an affirmation for me. And I still, I use it to this day. I am not a perfect human being. I've already said that numerous times. Right now, I just got through ending the first month in the last 14 or 16 where I didn't hit goal for the first time. And I've got this interview right here. And here I am back to square one going, do I share this with the listening audience? Absolutely, I do. Because you know what? Thank you. This is not the end all be all. This is one blip on a screen. And as long as I stay true to the values that I know and do what I'm supposed to do, I can come out of it. And that may be a lull. All of life is a series of ups and downs, you guys. And when we're in the trenches, we need to be able to know that that's actually a good thing because like a friend told me a long, long time ago, the best thing about being down in a big hole is you only you can only look up from there. Mm-hmm. The other advice that he gave me was, you know, the best way to get out of a hole is to stop digging. Uh-huh. Yeah. Two that very, one is thinking. Yeah. Anyway. Two very powerful messages. Well, we're coming to the end and I just want to keep on opening up more and more with you. But uh, one thing I'm taking for sure I'm going to write on a little sticky note, or at least uh, if not a one of those index cards that you talked about, I'm going to get a Sharpie out and I'm going to say 10 seconds to boldness. And, yeah. and, and I, I want everybody to do that today, to get your sticky note and put it right in front of where you, wherever you're working. And I think that that what Sean has shared with us today, you are able to take with you all of his inspiration, uh, his life experience. And another thing I'm taking, and because I feel it, I feel it from you, from your heart, is you bring love. Mm-hmm. You bring love to the moment. Yeah. And and Doreen, the only other thing that I really want listeners and, and viewers to, to get is, like you just said, love, love others, love yourself. If you're a spirit, if you have a spiritual have have some love for whatever that spiritual basis is. But most important, this book in your life is all about one other word, and that's belief. Mm. And my mission, as Dorian read at the beginning, and I, I say this with all sincerity, my mission is to try and help as many possible people as I can begin to believe in themselves. And that's the beauty of that simple phrase, 10 seconds of boldness. It can mean, or you can apply it however you want to, but you just validated the title of the book. And it means so much to me that you're willing to do that, Doreen, and tell your listeners to do that because Mm -hmm. that simple impetus is the beginning of moving in a different direction. And that's how life changes. That's how you change your voice. That's how you change your life. That's how you become whoever it is that you want to be. And it all starts with 10 seconds of boldness and a little bit of courage. Mm, I think those are wonderful last lines for our conversation today. And let that ring out because uh, all of us listening to you today, Sean, feel empowered and feel possibility just by listening to you. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This has been a pleasure. Thank you for being with us today for this episode of Find Your Voice, Change Your Life. Each person Doreen interviews shares what has helped them find their voice. You can learn from these guests and find your voice so you can be confident to speak up and speak out. And remember to download Doreen's free seven-step guide to fearless speaking at Doreen7steps.com. We hope you enjoyed the show and we'll return next time. Until then, Goodbye for now.